uh, you know, today is April 16th. It would have been the day after tax day. Um, and uh, it's, it's the time for our Poverty and Homelessness Board meeting for April. What I'd like to do is welcome everyone. And uh, why don't we go around uh, the webcam call here and see who's, see who's with us. Um, I'm Pat Walsh, I'm with Vox Public Relations. Pat Farr, Board of County Commissioners. Steve Manila. Go ahead. Right, Steve. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Paul Solomon, Director of Sponsors. Steve Manila, uh, Manager of Human Services for Lane County. Doreen Donalds with United Way. Rick Kincaid, uh, Community Health Centers of Lane County. Deborah Daly, Ron. Eugene Fort Day School District. Ron Murphy, Low Hill Center. Carol Balthrop from the Eugene Mission. Ashley Espinosa, Commander Lane County. I heard Ashley. Sorry, guys. Ashley Espinosa. I'm going to just leave it at that, guys. <laughs> okay. Amanda Cobb, Children Community Health Plan. Hi, this is Stephanie Jennings, City of Eugene. Welcome. Is that it? My chat box says Jacob Fox is there. Yeah. Yep, Thank Jacob you. Fox is on. Hey, everybody. Hey, Jacob. We also, we hey, Jacob. Also have Aaron Box. Welcome, Aaron. Uh, Lisa Stewart, Lane County. Brian Lang. Hi, Brian. Is that, if that's it. Um, and Susan Lopez. Melissa Coloma, who's Lane County staff, Mayor Venice, and Aaron Fifield. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Before we get started, um, I'd just like to have us take a moment of silence. You know, Ann Williams kind of ded has ded dedicated her life to us, to helping people with housing and, and in many, many other ways. As many as you know, she passed away a few days after our last uh, Poverty and Homelessness Board meeting. So if we can just remember Ann's memory and to just take a moment of silence before we get into our work, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like us to go ahead and do that. So moment of silence for Ann and gratitude for her hard work. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone, um, and, and I'm glad you're all here today. I want to keep this meeting as close to an hour as possible. I know you all have plenty of work to do. So um, with that, um, committee updates, which we're in the meeting meet, meeting packets. Any, any, uh, any, any comments or thoughts people want to put forward? Anything you want to say, Alex? So the committee updates for the sake of time and brevity, we had them in the meeting packet. They're on the very last page. I'll scroll to that right now. There are a lot of membership updates. Sorry, here we go. Um, the membership committee would like to recommend Aaron Box for the faith-based representative position, as well as Brian Lang from Pacific Source, as we have two com coordinated community organizations, coordinated care organizations, excuse me, um, and then with the passing of Ann Williams and the retirement of John Radich, we have two new vacancies. We uh, have opened up the Youth Homeless Representative call for applications. We have many membership terms expiring June 30th, and all the members whose terms are expiring are asked and invited to serve another term uh, but we have to put up public vacancy, public posting for vacancies as well. 
Alex, haven't some of us termed out? Isn't there a, a limit to a number of consecutive terms? Or not? I believe we try to encourage new membership and leadership, but um, we also don't exclude people. Okay. Well, well that, that's good to know. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Um, does anybody from the committees have anything they want to add to their to their uh, reports? Okay. Um, if not, let, let's move forward. And um, can I entertain a motion to approve Aaron Box for representative of our faith-based communities? So moved. Second. This is Green. Okay. Um, all in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? No. Well, congratulations, Aaron. Uh, I know I think you're on the call here and welcome to the committee. Can you please? There we go. And then why don't we, um, we'll have to do the same, th let's do the same thing with, um, with Brian Lang from Pacific Source. Um, again, I need to entertain a motion to accept oh, Brian. This is Green. Okay. Second. I second. This is Sean. Okay. All in favor? Uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Well, welcome, welcome, Brian, and welcome, Aaron, uh, to the Poverty and Homelessness Board. We're glad, we're glad you're here. I also want to just take a moment to uh, recognize the good work John Radich has done over many years on, on uh, in our on behalf of um, our community and also as a participant in the in the board. Um, so let's move on to the COVID-19 response. Um, Steve Manila. So um, what I'm going to report on is what we know to date on the federal, state, and local resources that we have that relate to the work of the Poverty and Homelessness Board. Um, you know, as you know, um, Lane County and the City of Eugene and City of Springfield, through their emergency operations, have put in place additional uh, shelter beds and additional uh, services for folks that are homeless and also reaching out to the rural areas of the county and the food pantries. Um, what I'm going to talk about is specifically some of the federal and state resources that uh, will be coming our way in the weeks to come um, and also mention uh, <laughs> some of the resource that's available locally. Um, so the state of Oregon is receiving uh, $7.8 million in community services block grant as the anti-poverty agency for the county. Um, we should receive a portion of that. Uh, we still haven't gotten uh, a clear indication as to when that will be available. Uh, also, the state of Oregon is receiving um, uh, $8.2 million of low-income energy assistance funding, and we're still waiting to find out when that will be coming. We'll work with the local utilities in getting that out. Um, the balance of state uh, community development block grant funds, uh, there are a number of us who are working on uh, trying to work with uh, the Oregon Department of Economic Development uh, to get uh, funding for rent assistance outside of the cities of Eugene and Springfield. Those dollars are available in the balance of county. And then the emergency solutions grant through HUD. Um, there are two installments of funding. The first installment should be coming soon. Um, those funds um, can be used for rent assistance, shelter, outreach. Um, we're still waiting again from the state of Oregon. Um, this has been one of those things where all the dollars uh, that are coming from the federal government, there's been some guidance that has been given to the state and the state is working with uh, in developing plans. And in the next couple of weeks, we should know more definitively what the allocations will be to Lane County. And then also uh, specifically uh, recommend a plan of action. Um, our HSD staff team has been working on looking at um, uh, propping up a, um, a more extensive rental assistance program with um, these dollars. 
uh, both uh, looking at people who are currently enrolled in some of our programs as one target population uh, to prevent them from becoming homeless again, and then also um, having a uh, some sort of a web portal for applications for other people who are seeking rent assistance. Anyhow, as we uh, work on those plans and as we develop the systems, um, we will um, update uh, the PHB. Um, additionally, uh, so with the ESG funds, the state is receiving 13.49 million. Um, you know, we typically receive anywhere between 10 or 12% of the funding and uh, then this is the first of two rounds. Uh, the federal uh, allocation is 4.9, almost 5 billion. And the first 2 billion is, has rolled out to states. And then the uh, second 2 billion, uh, the HUD secretary has to come up with a different formula. It's supposed to be informed by uh, COVID-19. And uh, there's some indication that the formula that they'll be using will also look at states with high populations of unsheltered homeless in um, making those dollars available. So as we know more about those uh, federal resources, we'll let you know. Uh, the other thing that we've been working on is there's a potential that uh, there'll be money, additional money for, um, for um, emergency housing, rent, and uh, for food out of the uh, a special session of the legislature. Um, and um, there could be, uh, prior to that, uh, a meeting of the Legislative Emergency Board. Um, so we've been uh, working with uh, the Housing Alliance and other people on a statewide basis. The um, the Legislative Emergency Board has $75 million uh, that they can allocate without uh, the legislature coming into session. About 50 million of that is spoken for uh, by the Department of Forestry, uh, specifically uh, for summer uh, firefighting resources. So there's about $25 million that, that could be available for food and shelter and other kinds of uh, responses to vulnerable populations. Uh, so there's a potential there um, that the, the e-board could uh, provide some additional funding before the uh, legislature comes into session. Also, the legislature, um, uh, you know, there has been a uh, work on putting together a package uh, that would go in a, a legislative session that would inc include um, uh, $25 million for rental assistance, $30 million for energy assistance, $15 million for homeless services. Um, there's also, um, as part of that package, been discussion about bringing back the uh, $16.5 million for the access centers that were in uh, House Bill 4001 in the last session, of which um, Lane County was to receive uh, about $5 million uh, from that. Um, so those are all things that are being discussed uh, by the leadership to be part of the, um, the special session. Uh, so we expect the state to, to add to the resources that the feds are, uh, are providing us. Um, we also, uh, through our county administrator, put a pitch out to uh, the city managers in Eugene and Springfield around coordinating uh, the allocation of the CDBG dollars that each jurisdiction gets, as well as our community services block grant and our emergency shelter grant funding so that we can come up with a regional plan um, to address those needs. But we do know that, uh, you know, things like rental assistance will be um, a big uh, issue for a lot of folks. Uh, there are people who um, might not be able to pay the rent. Um, there's a rental moratorium and there's some concern that after the rental moratorium, there could be a cascade of evictions. Um, 
the uh, legislature also is looking at uh, uh, whether or not to put in some policy around um, how those uh, evictions would be mitigated or um, as a part of the uh, special session or at least uh, suggest that before evicting landlords will develop a plan um, and you know as a part of that one of the pieces that's important is that we want to bring up our rapid resolution services that were part of the TAC recommendations um, because we know that uh, some of the resolution that we're going to need to do is going to be uh, mediation with uh, between landlords and and tenants uh, so that people can stay housed and you know unfortunately um, you know in some of those sit situations not everybody um, understands what their rights are uh, and not everybody is um, you, you know understands exactly how to navigate those situations so we want to be able to have something in place uh, to be able to help folks in our community with those situations. So that's my update. And I think I've taken enough time and I know we have Amanda Borta and Lisa Stewart who have additional pieces of this uh, COVID response. Any questions for Steve? Mayor Venice. Oh, we had it, her audio up. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Someone's on the controls, and it's not me. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. I just wanted to um, highlight that I just got off the phone with David Saez at Central Latino, and um, the particular concern about the Spanish-speaking community not knowing their rights and being vulnerable to evictions, and uh, you know the need for uh, kind of focused outreach. And also recognizing going forward that uh, this is a community that um, is, you know, they're undocumented, many of them, they're not gonna qualify for uh, unemployment benefits. They, uh, they may, they're not gonna qualify for the $1,200 that other folks with social security are gonna get. So just wanting to put a pitch in there that both we need a pretty targeted focus, I think, uh, to that Spanish speaking population. I know I I, uh, I had sent on a uh, a copy of a survey that uh, Centro had done, and it speaks to that need among right. the population. May May I say something to that? Thing? Uh, it's Ashley Espinoza here. Um, uh, sorry, thank you for bringing that up, Mayor Venice. Um, it is such a huge, a huge problem that's happening because the translations, even in Spanish, weren't coming out until two weeks later, really. I mean, when everything was happening, we were not seeing translations coming out. Um, and knowing that a lot of the essential workers um, as well are, are you know, the, a lot of them are in the Latino community, um, you know, I feel like we really did drop the ball in, in getting the information out to the community in the language that they speak. But one thing I do want to just keep in mind with being focused is that both Dev Northwest and um, Oregon Community Foundation, I was on a call the other day, and I don't exactly know how they were able to do it. And I don't know if, Maureen, you have some, you can speak towards this, but somehow when they're able to make some focus, you know, around the funding is looking at rural communities and communities of color being able to allocate, like, specific funds to those communities so that the, because what was what's happening is is that they're getting left in the dust i mean there's so many applications and so many people that are fighting for the same money that communities that are by the time they get the information it's just there's no money left and so um being thoughtful in that way and then another thing i just wanted to to mention it's also mixed family um immigration statuses so let's say someone everyone let's say has documentation to be here leak you know they're they have social security numbers, everything, and let's say one person in the family does not, then they're all left out of the stimulus package um, relief. So that's something to keep. Great. Good, thanks, Ashley. We lost you there at the end. Okay, sorry. Yes, thank you, that was. Okay. Those, those are, are, are good points. You know, the, the question, too, that I have is, Steve, what is in place for landlords 
you know, often it, it's the landlord needs the rent to keep, you know, to keep the property and the bank needs the money from the landlord. So what, is there anything specific that's being dealt to provide them with assistance as well? Or how does that work? Yeah, that's something that I'm not very um, clear on. Um, I, like others, am following, uh, you know, the uh, payroll protection and the other things that are available for small business people. Yeah, and okay. I will make a point of um, researching that uh, to see if that's something that the state of Oregon uh, Housing Community Services or, or someone is going to be working on. I'm, I'm assuming that if there's a statewide effort, um, you know, there would be some outreach to landlords coming from the state of Oregon and some kind of assistance for them to navigate. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Steve? If not, Amanda, can you give us an update on the COC and emergency operations? Sure. Um, I think everyone can hopefully hear me now. Um, so I'll try to keep this somewhat um, brief. There's been a lot in the last three to four weeks. Um, and I know some other uh, people on this call have been on other calls and probably know some of it. Um, so we know um, our, our unhoused folks are facing a lot of particular challenges during this time. Um, as many have said, this is definitely unprecedented and we're all sort of learning as we go. Um, with the stay at home order in place, I think businesses and you know nonprofits have changed the way they're doing uh, their work. Um, some have closed or have otherwise you know reduced hours or moved to virtual services. And so many of the places where our, our unhoused folks normally spend their days are no longer accessible. Um, and that presents a number of challenges, including you know the library. these are these are places where people access the bathroom, um, get a meal, fill their water charge their phones. So these are all things we've um, really tried to address really rapidly. Um, so all of these are proving to be, you know, already challenging, but then exacerbated by, by this pandemic. Um, so the county, uh, as well as the city of Eugene and city of Springfield have, have really responded quickly uh, as the guidance continues to evolve and change. We've continued to evolve and to change our, uh, our approaches. So some of the initial things that were rolled out um, were certainly hand wash stations, bathrooms were deployed by the city of Eugene and uh, the city of Springfield. So there's maps online available for where those are located. Uh, the county uh, responded by opening uh, a couple of options for folks to shelter in place. Um, for those who have a place to be, we are certainly encouraging folks to stay where they are. Um, that has been the message. Uh, and that is the guidance from CDC and from other sources as well. So that is our, our approach. Um, however, we know not everyone is able to do that. And so uh, the expo halls at the fairgrounds are available. Uh, those, that place serves 140 folks a night. Uh, Springfield Memorial Building serves 32 people a night. Um, and again, those are also shelter in place options. And so people are encouraged to stay at those um, if they're staying there uh, and not sort of come and go as well. And then we also opened uh, the Wheeler Pavilion, which is our medical respite option for uh, up to 44 individuals. So that place serves um, people that have respiratory symptoms that are presenting at either of those shelter options. Um, there's also some other connection points to Wheeler as well. Um, so those were set up very, very rapidly um, within a week, I think. Um, and so we're continuing to evolve. Those have um, health and safety protocols in place, so temperatures are taken daily, there's uh, bed spacing, social distancing, uh, environmental health is out there doing inspections uh, weekly, and so uh, those that have evolved, I think every day there's changes made, but uh, we certainly have protocols in place at those shelters. The fairgrounds is run by uh, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, Memorial Building is now um, carry it forward, and then Wheeler is uh, being run by Occupy Medical. So we've really definitely seen a lot of um, our community partners and agencies really step up to the plate and do extraordinary work um, really quickly in response to this. And that's been really impressive. Um, the shelters have been pretty consistently full, I would say, um, aside from Wheeler Pavilion, which has served um, anywhere from one to five, I think, people a night. Um, and so for those uh, who are not accessing those shelters, we've also, uh, Laura Ashworth from our office has worked really closely with the city Eugene to move forward some of our outreach efforts um, to get folks 
supplies so we're trying to shelter in place uh, white bird has a distribution site um, to get supplies out to get information to people and that's also where people can access the uh, individual sites that the cities have set up so um, the city of Eugene has uh, I believe Hilliard Amazon and Peterson barn for individual camping spots as well as parking spots so those are more individual non-congregate options which is the direction that we're we're sort of going um because obviously that's better than the, the congregate site um and the city of springfield is also working to open a, an additional distribution site through the memorial building hopefully very soon um with a separate entrance from the shelter using that lower level so again a lot of things moving very quickly all of these things were set up within the last few weeks um so continuing to change and learn as we go um, the river avenue property is still um, sort of pending some um, adjustments and reviews for fema um, and so there's some work that needs to be done in the building before that can be used but that the intention is to use that building as soon as we are able to um, so i think that covers most of what the sort of emergency response work has been um, there's certainly more <laughs> mixed in there um, but that's sort of the high level update um, as far as our coc programs things have been operating um sort of on an adjusted um adjusted way i guess uh, so they're continuing but services and supports are mostly virtual um, or have been adjusted as needed um, Folks can still move into units, although that's been really challenging and there's a number of um, things that can't be done right now. Front door assessments continue, but they're being done on the phone. Um, and we have applied for several um, waivers through HUD for the COC and ESG program. So the good thing about it is that HUD has been really supportive and has really offered a lot of ways for us to be really flexible with funds that we've never been able to do before. Um, so we really need to figure out how to use those flexibilities to make sure we're still continuing to get people housed and get people uh, accessing uh, COC programs. So those are continuing. We have calls every week on Wednesday um, at 3 p.m. with all of our social service providers. So those are open to anyone to call into if you need the information. Um, I know some of you have joined those already. So those are a good way to get regular updates um, weekly. So. If there's any questions I can answer, I know that was a lot. Uh, Commissioner Farr. <laughs> Chair Walsh, I see Noreen Donalds has a question, so I'll wait for her question first, if, if I may, and see if it gets an, if my question gets answered by her question. Thank you, Pat. I really appreciate it. First of all, I just want to say, wow, it's incredibly impressive to see the collaboration that's happened in the last few weeks with getting so many um systems in place to to house folks um so kudos to all the partners that have been involved with that and um so it's a, an amazing amount of work in a short amount of time i am curious that one of the things i'm curious about is the fairgrounds in particular i know that um st finney's is doing the keys management there but what does a typical day like, look like if i know it's i had somebody respond to my question earlier is it just to dawn and it sounds like it's more like a full housing, I mean, full-time housing situation. How are folks maintaining or, um, that six feet sort of social distancing um, structure? How does that, how does that work? What does it look like? Um, just, just sort of needed a visual or something. <laughs> yeah, um, so I've only been out, I was out that way at sort of the beginning of things. People are able to come and go, although we've really, in the last week or so, encouraged folks to stay there as much as they can um, because the idea is for people to shelter in place. It's very challenging for folks to have a lot to do there during the day. We are providing three meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, which keeps them busy for that period of time. Um, but there aren't a lot of activities that don't, um, don't obviously involve things that multiple people have to touch um, or that could potentially spread germs. And so um, we've tried to offer suggestions. I'm not sure um, St. Vincent de Paul would probably be better to answer what folks are doing uh, during the day at the fairgrounds property. Um, I think people are staying in place a little bit more than they were at the initial um, sort of launch of the shelter. Um, we were hoping to try to get you know some TVs or other things out there for folks at least to have things to do um, but yeah, again, it's challenging. We don't want to provide books or other things like that that could potentially that aren't sanitizable um, objects. So um, 
Yeah, we also have, um, I think as of this week, behavioral health services going out there um, to make sure people have access to counseling and things like that. Um, so we're trying to address people's needs as much as possible, um, but it is challenging during the day to keep people busy. <laughs> is there is there an opportunity then for if we could get some TVs or some other kind of um, entertainment systems set up? That should I be working through St. Vincent Paul to ask that question? Do you think? Yeah, I haven't. I know we had initially offered some suggestions, and I'm not sure what they've um, put in place as of today. So okay, I would have to follow up. And Thank you. Commissioner mm -hmm. <clears throat> Farr. Thank you, Noreen. You almost covered my, my question, but uh, a question, Amanda, that I have that pe people are asking me, and I've forwarded these questions quite often. If you can answer this thoroughly, go ahead. If not, uh, I can maybe fill in a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about what, what we are offering or um, recommending to homeless youth at this point in time? Sure. So there was an initial discussion about um, a space that could be available for youth initially, um, and we weren't able to stand that up because um, we were working mainly on getting the fairgrounds and Memorial and Wheeler up and going, uh, which was already a pretty heavy lift. Um, and since that time, the move has really been away from uh, congregate settings. And so we are really focused now on trying to locate places where we can have folks um, individually uh, able to camp or at least um, more individual spaces available um, rather than opening additional congregate settings. Um, so the county has not been um, working on opening an additional space for youth as far as a, a congregate shelter space, but we are looking to find locations where we can have individuals, maybe including youth as well, um, be able to shelter in place who are not able to do that elsewhere. Can I give Thank an you, Amanda. That that, can that's I consistent with what I've heard from uh, Karen Gaffney, but I see Noreen has a, some yes. response. So please go ahead, Noreen. Yes, Sorry. please. So for about a week and a half, this has been one of the, the, the issues that I've been working on um, directly with Megan Schultz. And um, so it sounds like United Methodist Church, which has been sort of the Egan, sec, um, Egan location for, um, the, for youth, um, and they have, a, they have offered their location um, St. Vincent de Paul has agreed to provide case management. And um, as of this morning, I have a donor who is going to provide a significant gift to support case management for at least a month. And I know there's a couple of other organizations in the community that are also thinking about how they could support that. I haven't had a chance to get to Megan because I've just been in back-to-back -back meetings today. But um, I know that's one of the things she's been working on because um, she also surveyed uh, youth that have been involved with the 15th Night Initiative, and a third of those youth have um, have predisposed issues like asthma. And so we need to get, you know, they need to be in a place where they can be sheltered and have internet access so that they can also um, engage with uh, distance learning through the school district now. So um, I am feeling really good about at least for the next month, we get these resources into um, St. Vinny's hand and get that stood up pretty hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, but there's gonna be probably, um, there will need to be additional resources to support that, that particular effort. Thank you for that addendum, Noreen. And uh, just a little bit beyond, that also is consistent with what I've been hearing. A little beyond that is that I've been assured that uh, should anyone, any youth need uh, quarantine, or special emergent uh, medical services that we will be able to accommodate that. Um, I, I don't know the details of that, but Steve Manella, um, I think uh, what we're hearing is that we need to continue to work with Blaine County in coordination with perhaps First United Methodist and Pastor Adam Brittle, who has uh, been raising a few questions to make sure that we are comfortable that youth do have both existent and, uh, and emergency accommodations as they are needed. Thanks, Amanda. That work, by the way, will go on much beyond the adjournment of this meeting. All right, anything else for Amanda? You know, Cheryl Balthrop, if you're on, if you've got just a, a couple minutes to share with us what's going on down at down at the mission is uh, the other major player in, in this, in this uh, situation with housing people. Sure, thanks, uh, Kat. So we are one of these congregate locations and very sensitive to the risks um, to our guests of 
contracting the virus and also being potential transmission source. So when the governor um, enacted the shelter in place, we did that as well. And we have de-densified our guest population to the fullest extent possible, spreading out through our campus. Um, we have converted our office spaces and our other available office areas into dormitories to try to put our more vulnerable individuals away from um, other individuals. And we've gone throughout our, our buildings and marked out spaces so that we're getting folks more than six feet apart um, with, as you can imagine, the challenges of doing so with hallways, et cetera. We've, all, we've also expanded our meal times and other situations where folks would be gathering to try to get the groups as small as possible and as spread out as possible. We also are asking, but really it's a requirement that everyone be wearing masks. And that has uh, that's challenging because we're not a police state, but we are really encouraging our guests to be wearing masks because even before COVID-19, uh, a number of our guests have respiratory issues and other compromised immunity issues. And it's sometimes difficult to tell who has uh, an allergy or asthma or other things versus who might be presenting with early symptoms. And we're very, very sensitive to protecting their health and also to addressing a potential um, spread. And we have been very, very grateful. Lane County has um, had a couple of nurses down who have screened our entire population already, and they'll be coming back next week. And thus far, we haven't had any positive cases, and we're we're just very pleased about that. And we um, we have, like I said, we're sheltering in place. So that was a big change for us, a very difficult thing, where we're not doing drop-ins. Um, we are serving those individuals with a mobile unit, um, but we recognize that many of those individuals who are accessing meals and showers don't have that access at the mission um, presently. Um, we, we spoke with them um, in county. We don't have a food permit, but we're trying to get our food through partnering with other community partners. Um, but I think a conversation about how these individuals are accessing showers and other resources is something that should be ongoing and looking for other opportunities is critical. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Anybody got a question for Cheryl and what's happening at the mission? Pat Farr. Regarding the food permit, uh, Cheryl, uh, thank you. Uh, regarding the food permit um, and Lane County, can you give just a one sentence of detail there and maybe you and I can talk later about that? Uh, yes, we were wanting, we have a mobile unit that's going out and we were hoping to just use our food services to deliver meals and they're not prepackaged. You know, if we're delivering granola bars that are packaged, that's fine. But if we're bringing meals from our kitchen, that's not covered under our, our health, our, our service permit or food permit. So we were told um, that we would need a food permit. I would love to have either a waiver or some sort of emergency ability because we are getting approached, our mobile unit is being approached for food and we'd like to be able to just put in a safe way, but in food boxes with our mobile unit to expand access because we too are trying to get resources, essential resources to folks where they are so that they're not needing to navigate around town. And we know many of the folks that were our drop-ins where they're located around town. And this can just further supplement uh, the mobile resources that I know the, have been stood up by, or stand, I never get these terms right, but are being standed up by um, the city and, and other, other individuals and entities. Thank you, then, uh, then I can presume you're waiting for an environmental health inspection, so. Is that um, what is needed, Pat? I'm sorry, I'm Commissioner. I'm I think so. With what needs to happen next. We've been, I, we're on I think so, I'll follow through on that. I'll follow through Great, on that after this meeting and I'll give you a buzz back. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Anything else? If not, let's, uh, Lisa Stewart, data tracking. All right. Um, uh, Alex, if you can switch the screen. 
That'd be great. All right. And let me know. Oh, there we go. There we go. Welcome, good. Mm -hmm. um, just to follow up on uh, what Amanda was sharing about the. Um, there we go about the uh, respite sites that have been that were set up so quickly. Um, year to or what we as of today, we've served 449 individuals um, with the uh, at one of these sites, either in Springfield or Eugene Expo Center or at the a few people at Wheeler. And what we're looking at, the majority of people that we are serving are men. Um, majority are white or non, uh, not, not a person of color. Um, and we are, uh, the, we have a few veterans that we're serving. Uh, just to give you a, an idea, we are taking a look at this. We have uh, Mo Young from County Admin is, is looking at these data to make sure that we haven't built in some kind of barrier that's creating a, a disparity in the way that, that we're able to deliver the services. So that is one uh, piece of information that we have. Another um, that we're working on that I think is pretty exciting is that we have uh, created a, uh, an extension to our contract with Collective Medical and Collective Medical is the service used in hospitals and emergency departments, emergency rooms, where um, we can, they look at data from different emergency departments, different um, practice management, and also now they'll be looking at people who are on our homeless by name list. Mm -hmm. And that means that when somebody enters into an inpatient or an emergency department, the staff will know that this individual is experiencing homelessness or is very housing insecure, and they will be able to tailor those treatment plans, understanding that that person, when they leave, will not have housing. And that really does matter. A, a certain treatment plans uh, ask that the person go home and get bed rest, and if that person doesn't have a bed, the plan has to look differently. So we have this in place now, especially um, important, if somebody is released from the hospital and they are tested for COVID-19, that, that we have a, a better direction and a more quick way to get them over to the Wheeler Pavilion or whatever site we've identified for that person. And also um, if they're tested and we don't, uh, and they're, they're tested negative, but they still have health issues that we can address those um, with, uh, support from the homeless services system, helping triage that individual from the hospital. So we're excited about that. And I just put up the by name information for March 31st. So you could see these are the folks that we're talking about. Um, and let's see, finally, I just, we are also collecting information on um, self-reported information on if the person has experienced symptoms consistent with COVID-19, such as the coughs or shortness of breath, and that information. And if they've provided us that information, we are able then to look at the services, where they receive them, what type of services is. This is in place for if there is a COVID positive case that we can be sure to reach out to anybody who could have been contacted or in contact with that case and make sure we provide testing and um, good resources for those other folks who might be at risk because they were sheltered in the same place or perhaps received meals in the same place. And um, we're just really fortunate in our community that we have a shared system that um, has 195 projects in it right now, 30, I think it's 31 agencies are using the system now. Having a shared platform allows us to be really quickly responsive in events like this so we can um, assist people that are experiencing homelessness as best we can as a coordinated system. 
Any questions? That's what I got. For Lisa? Impressive data. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything for Lisa at this point? If not, thank you, Lisa. This is good work, again, as usual. It's important. Appreciate it. Um, let's move on to Noreen. I know you've got a few things you'd like to update us on. I guess I have to unmute. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to share um, just a little bit about what United Way is doing and a lot of the concerns that were brought up, um, we have heard too. Um, we started a COVID-19 fund about three or four weeks ago um, after we had um, um, surveyed a lot of nonprofits in the community to ask what they saw as their most imminent needs and sort of even try to think about what their short-term needs would be beyond immediate needs. And so we captured information from uh, folks in the community, all, not just United Way funded programs, but a lot of different agencies. And um, then we stood up a, um, a, an application process, very simple one page um, application, which is on our website. And um, we made our first round of investments two weeks, a week and a half ago. Uh, we have a small committee, Mo Young from the county serves on that committee, um, along with a few other, uh, handful of other folks in the community. And they basically are vetting applications for funding. It's very, a very simple application process, but also it's a small amount of money. It's $2,500. Um, we expect to do this funding round every other week for as long as we have resources in the pool. Um, and so the, the, the immediate first um, grants that were given out were uh, 27 um, focused on food pantries around the county from Mackenzie Bridge to Florence and Mapleton and just all of the small rural communities where um, they don't have access to the same kind of resources. And so um, a number of those investments, we also heard from many partners and folks in the community about rental assistance, which I think Steve talked a lot about, and there'll be, a, it sounds like a fair amount of resources coming to Lane County. Um, but we we talked, um, we've had several conversations with Centro, with David Saez, with uh, Marisa, um, 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 and um, with Brooke from um, Downtown Languages. Those three organizations, we had given them a grant to um, merge those three organizations into um, one larger entity serving the uh, some of the needs of our Latino population. And so there is a recommendation that's going to our board, and I know Rick Kincaid is um, our board chair, and he's on this call, um, that's going to go tomorrow uh, um, so that they can repurpose um, some of the funding they've received from United Way in this past year to really support the immediate needs of um, folks that they're working with. And many of, their, many of the folks that Centro is working with have lost their jobs, and they don't have access to government funding. And so we are um, wanting to support that with food supports and rental assistance. And then the other third big area the, for the first round was we heard from a lot of agencies that provide telehealth or telemedicine or you know, um, counseling services and needed some tech support to be able to um, set up um, some of those um, systems. So we funded a, a variety of agencies that were doing that, like CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, um, and a number of others. So we are right now in the midst of uh, reviewing 57 additional applications in this round. Um, and the review committee meets tomorrow to um, put their recommendations together. And then that'll go to our board for decision making. And we're doing this very quickly because we know how immediate the needs are. Uh, we're actually capturing the ACH the bank routing numbers. So we make the funding decisions. And on Monday, we'll notify those uh, agencies and programs that they've received funding, and then we'll uh, basically deposit Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning the dollars into their accounts because, again, it's um, pretty immediate. And I did say earlier, I talked a little bit, I shared a little bit about what we're trying to do to support um, the unhoused youth population. Um, I had a conversation this morning with a donor who's giving us 100000 and uh, we're so excited about that. Um, it, yeah, it kind of blew my mind, but I'm so excited. And fifty, we will earmark fifty thousand dollars for the um, Saint Vincent de Paul to do case management um, at the United Methodist Church um, for unhoused youth. So 
So that's a, a big deal. But I just wanted you to know we're doing that. We're also trying to capture in-kind needs of agencies. And so as um, we hear about um, agencies that need diapers or wipes or um, really just about anything, sleeping bags, I think last week we were able to um, put together 25 or 30 sleeping bags for this Springfield shelter that just got stood up, one of the shelters last week. Um, we're also capturing that information on our, on our website, on our volunteer site. And that is, so we have a lot of people that have been c connecting with us asking, how can I help? What can I do? And so we're just trying to capture what the in-kind needs are. And then um, people can see them on the site and then they can select or choose to provide um, support that particular way. So that's a lot to say um, that we're um, pretty deep in this. I've got an amazing team at United Way that I just makes me cry when I think about their capacity and their capability of setting some of these things up quickly. Now they're not, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars, but we are talking about a community that I am really proud to live in. Um, it's, we're seeing and hearing about caring and compassionate people who just want to help. And so um, just happy to share that with you. I'll put the, you, if somebody's interested in supporting the in-kind donations or volunteering or uh, providing um, uh, support, we've had $5 gifts you know, up to 50,000, up to $100,000 gifts in this fund. And um, I'm just really pleased that we can turn it right around. 100% of every dollar is going right back out to the community. Great, thanks Noreen. Any qu questions for Noreen at this point? Uh, Mayor Venice. Oh. Oh, I can unmute myself. There we go. Okay, I'm with you. Um, I, you know, I just wanted to thank uh, everybody, uh, everybody who has reported on this work, the work that is happening at the county level, the the work from the mission, the work from United Way. I, um, I, it's just phenomenal uh, amount that's been done, and I. Um, look forward actually to our debrief uh, a couple of months out about the work we have done and how that influences our ongoing work at both, uh, you know, at, at, as a broader community, we will have learned a lot of lessons. Uh, Rick Kincaid and I had this conversation yesterday about how, you know, we tend not to prepare, do preparation and prevention very well, but we act, we do really well in emergencies and we not to take the lessons from this emergency into our preparation prevention work. And so I just want to thank you all. I think um, all the requests that I get from people who want to help and I uh, recognize how many ways there are that for the community to really be engaged in a solution. And um, so it, it does, it makes me proud. I'm very relieved to hear that there's work from youth because of those emails and uh, so thank you. Just wanted to thank you all for the work you're doing. Thank you, Mayor Venice. Anything else? Uh, if not, we'll move into public comment. And I don't know if I can see if anybody is oh, trying to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just want, I wanted to follow up. It's been an issue that's popped up on our Wednesday discussions. And I too want to echo how encouraged I am by the level of collaboration. I am wondering though, if we're not missing opportunities with, you know, whether it's 4J or city, um, facilities that are not being used, you know, are there any showers or restrooms that could be used to for some of these pop up sites to provide just additional resources? I know there are staffing challenges. I know there are other things, but it seems like from a brick and mortar provision of showers and other resources that this is something that we need to look at with COVID-19 that we wouldn't normally stretch ourselves with. Uh, uh, Commissioner Farr. Thank you. That's a good question, Cheryl, that uh, uh, more detail than we have time to discuss um, is involved in that. Um, you know, I, I thank the city for opening up uh, community uh, centers, for instance. We just uh, opened up uh, Peterson Barn uh, for a few spaces, uh, but uh, the type of uh, emergency
emergency action that we're taking today can lead us to uh, solve issues that we've been talking about for a very long time. And that seizing an opportunity as it presents itself today may have ramifications may are beyond the two-month after action report that you were talking about. Uh, things that can uh, last into the future. Uh, the, the River River Avenue facility being a, a, a shining example of such, but much smaller. And I wonder, Mr. Chair, if we can talk at some point about how do we establish, for instance, mobile shower units currently, which can yes. service perhaps some of the shelf, some of the uh, smaller sites that have been set up. Long discussion uh, that will once again go beyond the termination of this meeting today. Right. Thank you, uh, Mayor Venice. Well, I I do I do have a question about Cheryl's need for uh, for some kind of showering facilities. Uh, I guess the question is around getting people to and from those showering facilities. Uh, we're trying to enable people to stay in place. If there were a portable system that were near the mission, would that work? I mean, I just, it's, I'm having a hard time envisioning where to place these in a way that we're not uh, compelling people to go all across the community. So maybe Steve has an answer. Yeah, Steve? Well, I know that, um... For the current response, uh, there are uh, shower trucks that are being leased, and um, but those are for limited use for the sites that we have sanctioned activity at. Um, I have that's been a concern of mine also. Uh, you know that Willamette Lane and Eugene Parks Recreation weren't able to keep shower facilities available. Uh, for people who shower at the, the pools normally. Um, I, I do think that we need to look in the long term in um, acquisition of shower trucks and a nonprofit. Uh, Salem, uh, the Community Action Agency in Salem um, operates uh, mobile shower trucks uh, to campsites. Mm -hmm. And um, we probably need to have something other than the, the trucks are difficult to lease, especially during the fire seasons, because the Forest Service in the summertime needs them. And that's why it's and it's more cost effective to purchase them. That's something we should look into um, along the way. Yeah, as I think Commissioner Farr said, um, this is and this is really important, Cheryl, and and I I think that it's probably a conversation we need to have with some action points um, soon, and maybe at another time, unless there's other thoughts. I'm glad you brought it up. That that's critical. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Chris McAllister here. Um, sorry, I was late. Had problems installing the app. That said. Um, I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to try and help our people with the showers. We have, when we were working with the city of Springfield, tried to access uh, the uh, showers with uh, some of the uh, groups that are already nearby to the uh, showers. But uh, that said, it wasn't able to work out. Um, so under the rules with environmental health and public health, after every shower, the unit has to go be fully cleaned. So when you're helping 32 people, that takes that, that takes uh, over two hours. When you're helping 60 people, that takes even more. We have, uh, this body has had a plan go before it that shows a place where you could have shower access, where you could do this stuff, where you could stay away from other people and not cross town. Our county parks have showers. Our county parks are owned by our body. By the, the the county, and so it's they don't have to woo a park district that's that to convince a, a, another is uh, a jurisdiction to make a decision. They can make that decision. We have showers, we have spaces, and every argument that shot them down for winter is not as relevant when it's a pandemic summer. I yield. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. Mayor Venice. Did you want to say something or? Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, that's a question for the county. It's a, yeah. a I don't, um, I'd be interested to hear if there's potential for that. Uh, Commissioner Farr. It is an ongoing discussion. We have conditions that exist regarding opening uh, parks uh, during the closed months of the year. 
it seems that it would be a relatively easy thing to open some spaces whether or not we open the the, uh, the showers the showers do get winterized um, and uh, they're not uh, really open again until I believe it's May 1st or sometime in early May so the discussion goes on it's been a level of a matter of uh, consternation for me but uh, it's an ongoing discussion thanks again Chris for bringing it up thanks okay uh, we with have that, one request for public comment. Okay, and and whoever that would you just state your name and and uh, where you live, and um, we'll uh, we'd be glad to hear you. You have three minutes. Marissa, you are unmuted. Oh, thank you so much. This is Marisa Sarate from Latinx Alliance of Lane County. I'm the director of Huerto de la Familia, and I'm just here to share briefly that. Our organizations in Latinx Alliance have conducted a survey of service providers. Some of you have received the report of the results of that survey. We've also been surveying immigrant families in our community directly, and we're in the process of creating a report that will show the concerns families are facing that are specific to immigrant families. And the truth is that these families who are already economically marginalized are going to face disproportionate impacts from COVID and we have some time to plan for how we can come up with solutions, but we do need to start brainstorming. Um, they're not gonna qualify for federal relief in the form of stipends and unemployment. And what we've come up with at the state level has been the Oregon Worker Relief Fund. It's meant to be um, a payout to families where there has been job loss as a result of COVID. And we're hoping that Lane County can show up as a leader in pushing this forward here in our local community. And hopefully that we could then impact the statewide agenda with moving that forward. We've been a leader in showing up for immigrant families in the past with um, NOAA Measure 105 and DACA processing and things like that. And it really does influence what's happening at the state level. Without a special session, they weren't able to consider it so far, but if counties are able to take action, then that will encourage there to be action from the state. So we just wanted to let you know that we're starting to create um, some momentum and a campaign around Oregon Worker Relief Fund, specifically a Lane County Worker Relief Fund, and we would greatly appreciate your support in any form around this. And we also hope to get you some more information to provide to you directly from clients. And housing is the biggest issue that clients are concerned about. As of right now, 71% of the people we have spoken with are afraid about how they're going to cover their rent. And when we look forward one month from now, that changes to, let's see, I believe it's 80, 82%. So that's a pretty significant number of people that we're speaking with that believe they will not be able to pay rent. And with current eviction moratoriums, they're able to stay safe. And we've talked with Mayor Venice and Lorna from City of Eugene about creating some campaigns to make sure families know that that also applies to them. Regardless of their immigration status, they're able to stay safely in their homes during COVID, according to a statewide moratorium. And then the next step is to brainstorm how we might be able to get some funds to families that desperately need to be able to pay rent and feed their kids. Thank you. Uh, any discussion about uh, what we've just heard? What we have I just wanted to support uh, to support Marisa's comment and think that the first critical piece is uh, making sure that we really are getting the information out to the Spanish speaking community about what their rights are and that they can report violations to the human rights and neighborhood involvement at the city of Eugene. And uh, so I'm happy to work with them to see if I can help boost the visibility of that information. And Yes, and I believe um, David Saiz from Centro Latino Americano and I will be reaching out to some of you individually to see if we might speak with you further about that piece and also the Oregon Worker Relief Fund. Great. And also, Marisa, with your survey, if you can, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to see that. If you could get that to me, I would appreciate it. And um, we would and be happy to. Perhaps we can, you know, as this board, we can talk about, the, well, obviously, this is a topic that's going to stay. Um, Stay pretty, stay very relevant for a while, and perhaps there's something we can we can talk about as a group. So, in terms of supporting this, um, but thank you. This, this is Alex Drew, Lane County staff. I have the report.
that Marisa referenced, so I will send that to all the Poverty and Homelessness Board members. And we have one more request for public comment from Chris McAllister. Okay, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Chris McAllister. I'm coming through. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, again, this app. Sorry. Um, I'm wanting to speak through the voices of multiple unhoused people who I've encountered in the last three weeks as we respond to COVID, as we respond to the items. Hello? You're good, You're good Chris. We hear you. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Who have had to deal with life changing situations that are even more restrictive than their already restrictive lives. We have people who are finding themselves evicted having to leave or under the threat of eviction. I have encountered for the first time in my services a full Spanish speaking families who didn't understand their rights, were not given due process and were made given threats from about using local law enforcement to have them removed. Mm -hmm. I am finding untreated people who are very sick but not sick in the way that gets them access to the one option of medical shelter that we're offering right now. We have people who cannot take care of themselves who belong in assisted living and supportive housing who are not able to get into our limited shelters. And so I have seen people turned away who then go sleep directly across the street. And there are in worse conditions than some of the people who happen to be first served who happen to be already there or who happen to be luck of the draw. We have done so much awesome, amazing work, not only as one community, but as a collaborative community. We have approximately 200 people that we are missing in terms of the vital, needed, necessary, untreated, underserved, unserved parts of our community. We need more Spanish support. We need more hearing handicap support. We need more options for people to stay in place and meaningfully be engaged. Now we set up congregate shelters. We understand that that's a way that we can do it in a quick way, usually with unhoused people. It does not usually work when it comes to helping specialized populations. How do we start to think outside the box and start working with the individual and finding their needs when they are a lot easier and a lot cheaper to fix on the ground? I think that we're overthinking sometimes and underdoing and then underdoing and overthinking about what we did. So we as a community just need to rally together, in my opinion, start looking at the whole problem instead of what we want to carve out for each community or each agency or each person. We need to look at the whole. We know we have people with dogs. We know we have families in RVs. We know we have people still being told to move along. How do we rise to the occasion? How do we serve like we have to a point where we don't have people taking pictures of our shower buses and sh shaming the community for taking care of the people who cannot take care of themselves? I really thanks, appreciate Chris. the opportunity. Th goodbye. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Any comments about uh, what Chris has had to say. I think, uh, I think we're trying, I think we're all trying to find ways to address a lot of these things. And I appreciate him underscoring some very specific things, but I, I know we're all working hard to, to get to get there on some of these points. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay. Well, if not, um, I want to thank you all for taking time to be here today. I know you have a lot of other things to do, very important things to do. Um, I want to uh, welcome Brian and Aaron to the board. I also uh, would like to acknowledge the good work that John has done, and, and I hope that we all carry forward in our work remembering the spirit of Ann Williams. Um, what, Steve? Um, I, I just want to mention uh, Alex underlined when the next executive committee yeah. meeting is. And I would just like folks to be available should we need to call an emergency meeting to take action regarding some of the federal funds that we're receiving. 
prior to that date? No, I, I appreciate that. Let me finish my comments, Steve, and okay. then we'll get to that. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that wrap up, um, uh, like I said, that we all remember, you know, the spirit in which Anne went about her work, and she was also certainly an inspiration for me and a lot of other folks. Um, I think we need to take down the line, take find out how we can address the shower situation relatively soon, and and also all of the, the things that Marisa brought up, I think, are absolutely critical. Some of our most vulnerable people that Marisa and Chris talked about, we we we've, we've got to remember them too in our big picture. Um, with that, we do have a, a meeting, an executive committee meeting coming up May 21st, and um, uh, an all-member meeting on June 18th. Um, as Steve just mentioned, in the meantime, we have to be available in case we need to meet, um, meet in between times in order to address what uh, is certainly a changing situation for all of us. Is there anything else for the good of the order? If, if not, I'm going to cancel. I'm going to not cancel. I'm going to um, adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.